Good morning, Unitable Lions Church! Oh, wow! You know, I feel like there's a praise coming on in here this morning. All right? He is risen! He is risen! He is risen! He is risen! All right, so, you know, last Sunday we had Palm Sunday. And we had these amazing branches. Everyone was waving them around as we welcomed our King of Kings. Well, I thought, you know what? We should have palm branches again for our Easter Sunday morning. Why? Because I call these my praise palms. These are my praise palms. So people who have a praise palm, when we see the word praise up on screen, I want to see these palms just praising, praising God, okay? Just like that. So can we just do a little rehearsal? Yes. So I say praise. praise. Hey. All right. Let's stand and do that again. I'm going to say one, two, three. Praise. praise. Yes. All right. So we want to see them waving and waving because we're going to worship our risen king this morning. All right. So here we go.
He's been so good to us. Can I get an amen? He's been so good to us. Come on. Please be seated. 
We have our scripture readers coming up right now. Good morning. My name is Bryce, a reading from Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 10. From the New Living Translation, The Resurrection. Early on a Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The gods shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the woman. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead just as he said it would happen. Come see where his body was lying, and now go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, and also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they went to him, got his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said, but the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands, look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I'm not a ghost, because ghosts don't have bodies, as you see that I do. As he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. Still, they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. Then he asked them, do you have anything here to eat. They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it as they walked. Luke chapter 24 verses 44 to 53. Then he said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, Yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit, just as my Father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven, the ascension. Then Jesus led them to Bethany, and lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to the heaven. So they worshipped him and then returned to Jerusalem, filled with great joy. And they spent all their time in the temple, praising God. This is the word of the Lord. Everybody, my name is Abigail, and this is my friend Sarah, and we are both in grade four. Please note that summer camp early bird registrations end today. Don't forget to sign up. Next Sunday, on April 7th, special guest Blair Watson will be coming with his reptiles and do a follow up with us for Easter. Please invite a friend to join. Can all the children from grade uh, from uh, JK to grade? Please come to the front.
Our story this Sunday is Jesus' death and resurrection. Our big idea today is celebrate because Jesus is alive and made a way for us to be close to God again. Can all the children repeat after me on the count of three? One, two, three. Celebrate because Jesus is alive and made a way for us to be close to God again. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for sending your one and only son to save us from sin. Please give us guidance and wisdom to learn about you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Can all the children meet the teachers in the lobby? Thank you.
invite you to sing. Please stand.
Good morning, brothers and sisters. You may be seated. Let's uh, bow our heads together in prayer. Father God, I come before you and I give you praise, Lord. And I thank you for bringing us all here together this morning to celebrate and to worship you together. I pray, Lord, that as we gather here today to remember the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to remember your victory over death, your victory over sin, Lord, that you help us hold in our hearts, Lord, the truth that we share, knowing that we are one with the risen Christ. I pray, Lord, that as we lift our hearts and our eyes towards you, that this moment stays with us, Lord, remember, uh, reminding us to keep our focus and to surrender everything that we have and to lay ourselves at your feet, Lord. I pray to ask that the Spirit descend upon this place, Lord, that the Spirit becomes a tangible presence around us. And I pray that you continue to establish our steps and continue to give us insight and discernment in everything that we do. I pray, Father God, that as we hear the message you have prepared today, that you soften our hearts and that you open our minds and our ears, Lord, to hear exactly what you want us to hear. And God, I pray that you continue to walk with us and continue to let us always know that yours is the victory and that your victory is our victory and that your faithfulness your goodness, your power, and your love will carry us through anything and everything that we may face in all of our days. And I pray all of these things in your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's most holy, most precious, and most beautiful name. Amen. There's a woman by the name of Rosario Butterfield, and she had a, an amazing job. She was a tenured professor at a university, uh, and she loved her, her work. But she was very antagonistic against the things of God, and particularly against Christians and some of the things that they stood for and some of the things that um, they believed in. And so she went about part of her research that she was writing about. She had to read the Bible. She had to uh, write some things about what Christianity stands for. And so she wrote an article, uh, and she got a lot of feedback from this article, both good and bad, so much so that she made two piles on her desk uh, to say this was the, the feedback that she got that was good about the article, and this is the feedback that she got that was critical about the article. But she got one letter from a pastor named Ken, Pastor Ken, and she didn't know what to do with the letter. It was very challenging for her. She couldn't put it in the, 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 the good pile because it wasn't good. She couldn't put it in the critical pile or the negative pile because although there were some questions there, it wasn't really critical. She could tell his spirit was good, so she decided to put it in the circular file. That's the garbage can. But a few hours later, being convicted, being moved to rethink about that letter, she pulled it out of the garbage can and thought about it and wrote back to Pastor Ken. And this started a correspondence. This started a, a, a time when she started to seek and search. And Ken and his wife invited her to their house for dinner. And she thought, this is part of my research. I need to find, figure out some of these things. So, you know, let me go and do that. And, and as she went to Pastor Ken's house for dinner, she felt something that was different. That he wasn't judging her. He wasn't uh, being dogmatic with her, but just showing love. She was invited into their home, invited into relationship with them. And as they talked and as they uh, shared one with another about what their beliefs were and what they thought the word of God said, I want to read to you what happened because 
what happened was they became friends. She said something else happened. Ken and his wife Flo and I became friends. They entered my world. They met my friends. We did book exchanges. We talked openly about sexuality and about politics. They did not act if such conversations were polluting them. They did not treat me like a blank slate. When we ate together, Ken prayed in a way I had never heard before. His prayers were intimate, vulnerable. He repented of his sin in front of me. He thanked God for all things. Ken's God was holy and firm, yet full of mercy. I started reading the Bible. I read the way a glutton devours. I read it many times the first year in multiple translations. Then one ordinary day, I came to Jesus open-handed and naked. In the war of worldviews, Ken was there. Flo was there. The church that had been praying for me for years was there. Jesus triumphed. I was a broken mess. Conversion was a train wreck. I didn't want to lose everything that I loved, but the voice of God sang a sanguine love song in the rubble of my world. I weakly believed that if Jesus could conquer death, he could make right my world. I drank tentatively at first, then passionately of the solace of the Holy Spirit. I rested in private peace, then community, and today in the shelter of a covenant family. See, Rosario started in a very lonely way, in a very lonely walk, but she met somebody. She met Ken and his wife, who became her friends and loved her. If you're here for the first time today and, and someone invited you to come today, now is the time you can just give them a little elbow and say, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> because they cared about you. And they wanted you to experience something and learn something about the story of Jesus, just like Ken did for Rosario. And she was able to discover what it is to know Jesus to love Jesus, and to follow Jesus. She went from a very lonely path into a covenanted family. The title of my message today is The One Solution to Our Current Epidemic. And you might wonder, what is the one solution? Or you might think, I think I know what the one solution is. It's Easter Sunday. But the better question might be, what is the epidemic that we're facing? We've just come out of a pandemic. What is this epidemic that we're facing? The epidemic that we're facing is loneliness. There is a sense of loneliness that's in the world today. There's, we, we live in such a, a high-tech world. We live in a world where we're more connected than any other generation in history. We have social media apps that help us to be connected with other people and have hundreds or even thousands of friends we live in a global village of commerce where we can buy things from across the, uh, on the other side of the world and have them shipped to us. The world is no longer a, a, a large place. What used to take months and months to travel to by ship or boat can now be done in just a matter of a few hours. Our world has become smaller. We are more interconnected than ever before, yet we are more lonely than ever before. We are more by ourselves than ever before. Sometimes we could even be in a, a marriage but feel the depth of loneliness. We could be in a family and feel the depth of loneliness. We could even have friends around us and feel the depth of loneliness. The epidemic that we're facing is this epidemic of loneliness. And friends, this is the reason why Jesus came Jesus came as Emmanuel, God with us. That name Emmanuel literally means God with us. He came so that we might not be alone, but that he might be with us, to dwell with us, 
to inhabit us, to be with us. This, this is the single greatest health concern right now. Last year, the Surgeon General of the United States put out an 82-page report talking about the concerns that he has about loneliness and how it is causing so many other ripple effects towards the health of their nation. Uh, a, a new report, the report that, that he put out said that um, loneliness has profound effects on mental health as well as heart disease, stroke, and dementia because there is a decline in social connectivity. We live now in a world where you can stay in your room and you can uh, order Uber Eats, not have to go anywhere. And if you need to do some groceries, you can go to Instacart and order your whole groceries and have it delivered right to you. You could stream whatever movie you want to stream and not have to go to the theater. You can chat with your friend over FaceTime. You can talk to this person and that person all over the world. And you can just stay in the comfort of your own home. We live in a world that we're so connected but yet so disconnected. We live in a time and a place where people are all around us, but if you talk to people individually, you'll see and experience the depth of loneliness that people feel. And maybe you're here today and you're feeling that as well. Maybe even within your own experience and your own situation and your own struggle and your own trial, you feel the depth of loneliness and wonder if other people really understand you or people really know what you're, you're going through or the trial that you're facing or the sickness or the hardship that you might have or the problem in your marriage or the problem with your children or the problem with your parents or the problem with your siblings. There is a depth of loneliness that Jesus came to actually fill. Uh, a doctor at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital here in the greater Toronto area said loneliness is as bad for you as smoking. And referencing an ongoing clinical study uh, at Mount Sinai said that she estimates that probably 45,000 deaths a year are in connection to loneliness because of the ripple effects that loneliness has. The Word of God says this in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verses 9 and 10. Two people are better off than one for they can help each other succeed. If one person fail, falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone, they're in real trouble. If you fall alone and by yourself, you are in real trouble. Here in Canada, amongst youth aged 15 to 24, nearly one in four, about 23%, say that they always or often feel lonely. In a survey of Canadians between 18 and 39 years old reported the highest levels of moderate to severe anxiety, loneliness, and feelings of depression of any age group. I think I have some stats there, yeah. And you can see some of the percentages that are there. Loneliness, anxiety, depression. These are things that are surrounding us. We live in such a connected age. We live in such an age where there's so many resources, there's so many opportunities, there's so many ways in which we can get help, but yet more and more people are feeling more and more alone. Friends, if you're here today and you're feeling alone, I have a solution for you, not me, but Jesus. There is hope in Jesus. Hope has a name. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. This is the story of Easter. It's actually the story of Christmas that goes all the way till Easter, that Jesus came into this world for you and for me so that we might experience his presence and know his comfort and know his guiding hand with us even in the midst of our most difficult pain and difficult struggle and difficult trial. You know, before, the, before uh, the 1800s, the word loneliness wasn't even in regular use in the English language. Because even though they were, people were less connected than we are in terms of technology, they were more connected to each other in their presence with families and neighbors and talking with one another. In 2018, uh, in England, they appointed a minister of loneliness. Can you imagine? And Japan followed suit three years later. In Australia and New Zealand, they have national loneliness strategies because they realize the impact that this is having. 
And re researchers have seen that uh, more time you spend on Facebook, actually you feel more and more alone. The more time you spend on social media, you actually feel more and more alone. Friends, Jesus walked a lonely path so that we don't have to be lonely. Jesus walked that lonely path for us. As we've been looking at in this, uh, in this past weekend for, of Good Friday and Easter Sunday, the story of Good Friday, the story of Easter Sunday is Jesus going into the Garden of Gethsemane. And even though he went with his 12 disciples, he was all alone praying in agony. Have you ever felt that before? That even though you might be surrounded by people uh, that you know and love, but yet they don't understand the depth of loneliness that you're feeling or the struggle or the pain that you're going through. Well, the, Jesus was like that with the disciples in Gethsemane. And to make matters worse, even though they were physically there and Jesus was by himself praying, later on, even their physical presence left as they fled when Jesus was arrested. And so first he lost, first he had their physical presence and didn't have their emotional presence. And later on, he lost even their physical presence. And he was all alone. And he had to walk that pathway alone. But he did that for you and for me. And then he went to Calvary. He went and he died on the cross for you and for me. And he died on the cross alone, even to the point that when he hung on the cross and he was looking up to his father in heaven, and at one point he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was such a lonely path that Jesus had to walk down. That was such a lonely journey that Jesus had to walk down. But he did that for you and for me. Emmanuel came, God with us, came and journeyed in that lonely path so that his presence might be with us and so that we don't have to feel that same loneliness that he went through. Jesus took upon himself all of the sin of the world, my sin and your sin, so that he might be together with us. Because friends, our sin separates us from God. This was the problem from the beginning of creation. When Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, when they sinned, they were separated from the presence of God. Before, they used to enjoy the wonderful communion and presence of God. But when they decided to disobey God and sin against God, that sin separated them from God. And no longer could they experience the, the beauty of the presence of God. In the book of Isaiah 59, it says, Listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to hear your call. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. If you're here today and you're wondering, how can I take some steps toward Jesus? Here's the first step to realize and acknowledge that we are sinners. I'm a sinner. We all are sinners. We all have sinned, and we have fallen short of God's standard and God's glory. But the beauty of this verse, it says, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you. The Lord's arm is not too weak to save me. Praise be to the Lord that he has come to save us. He has come to redeem us. In the book of Romans, chapter 6, it says, For the wages of sin is death. That's why Jesus died on that cross. He died on the cross to pay the penalty of sin for us because the wages of sin is death. But the beautiful thing is that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He took the punishment and he took the penalty of sin because sin was separating us from God. And he said, that's not good. I don't want sin to separate me from my people. So I'm going to come down to earth and I'm going to die on the cross and pay the penalty of sin, which is death, so that I can be reunited with my people, so that I could be Emmanuel, I could be with my people and give them the free gift of eternal life. And friends, today we can all experience that free gift of eternal life. This is the story of Easter. This is all what it's about of the resurrection because Jesus' resurrection brings us life and life in all of its abundance and fullness. We all can experience that abundant life in Christ. 
It says in the book of Romans chapter 4 and verse 25, he was handed over to die because of our sins. Our sins put him on the cross. And he was raised to life to make us right with God. He was raised to life so that we might have life and life in all of its abundance, all of his fullness. In Romans chapter 5, it says, for if while we were God's enemies, when we are alienated from God, when we are far away from God, because of our sin that separated us from God and put us far away from God's presence, we were reconciled to him through what? Through the death of his son. How much more? Having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? If because of the death of Jesus, we were reconciled to him because he paid the price for us, he paid the penalty for us, he shed his blood for us, how much more now, because he is resurrected, because he is living, can we enjoy abundance of life? Because Jesus is alive, we can rejoice in the fact that we have life and life in all of his abundance. And you might be here and you might be thinking, oh, I don't know whether Jesus actually rose again from the dead. Well, starting from tomorrow, um, on our social media accounts, we're going to be putting out a couple of video, a few videos talking about the 10 evidences of the resurrection of Jesus. And I want to encourage you to watch that if you have some questions and doubts to try to figure out, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Well, there is some evidence, there is some factual proof that we can look to, to prove the evidence, to show the evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. We can rejoice in that fact that this is not a myth. This is something that actually happened, and it's something that we celebrate on Easter Sunday, on Easter weekend. But we don't just celebrate it on Easter weekend. We celebrate it all throughout. In the book of uh, Luke chapter 4, this is the reason why Jesus came. Jesus came here. When he was here in this world, he came to do a few specific things. And in all of what he was doing, he was trying to bridge that gap from people that were lonely to come to God. And in Luke chapter four, it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is what Jesus was saying. He was actually quoting from an Old Testament portion in Isaiah chapter 61. He said, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. I wanna tell you today, you are not here by mistake. You are here to hear this word that the time of the Lord's favor has come. The time of the Lord's favor has come for your life. The time of the Lord's favor has come for your family. The time of the Lord's favor has come for you because Jesus is alive. I want to tell you very quickly five stories in the New Testament, five examples of how we can see that Jesus took people from a lonely pathway and brought them into communion and fellowship with God by delivering people, as it says here, from oppression, from bondage, from captivity, from all of these things and bringing them into relationship with God. The first thing is this, is that he brought people into freedom. And I'll use the example of a man who had was possessed with so many demons. Jesus was in one particular place and he took a boat to go to another place. And as he took that boat to get to the next place, he was going with one specific purpose. He wasn't going to meet a crowd of people. He wasn't going to meet a group of people, but he was actually going to meet one specific person. And when he came to the other side of that lake, he met this one specific person who was all by himself. His family had forsaken him. His friends had forsaken him because he was living such a wild life. He was oppressed. And friends, you might be here and you might have certain addictions in your life that nobody else knows about. You might have some things in your life that because of those addictions, they're actually alienating you from having good relationships with other people. That maybe on the outside, it looks like you're doing community and having a good family and having all of those things, but inside, you know the addictions that you are struggling with is actually preventing you from having real fellowship and communion with other people. Well, this man, he was addicted. He was in bondage. And Jesus came to him all alone, by himself, without family, without friends. And Jesus met him where he was at. And Jesus set him free. 
In Luke, it says this. He tells him after he sets him free and he delivers him from all of these demons, he says, now go back to your family and tell them everything God has done for you. His family had forsaken him. They didn't want anything to do with him. But go back and tell them what God has done for you. So he went all through the town proclaiming the great things Jesus had done for him. Friends, God takes us from a lonely pathway and brings us into the family of God. In the book of Psalms, it says this, God places the lonely in families, and he sets the prisoners free and gives them joy. That's what happened to this man, this man who was possessed with so many demons when he was liberated, when he was set free, he was filled with joy. He wanted to follow Jesus. He wanted to stay with Jesus, but Jesus told him, go back to your family, tell them all the good things that God has done for you. God can give us freedom by bringing us into communion and fellowship with him. He takes us from the lonely pathway of oppression and bondage and brings us into the glorious liberty of the children of God in the family of God. The second thing is healing. There's a story of a man who had leprosy and this man that had leprosy had a lonely journey. At that time, if someone had leprosy, they were by themselves or either in a leper colony. They couldn't have fellowship and couldn't connect with other people. So much so that if they were traveling to one place and somebody else was coming by, they had to scream out, leper, leper, so that the other people could stay away and not get the sickness that they had. This man was traveling by himself. This man was all alone because he had leprosy. Have you ever felt like that as well in your life? That maybe because people misunderstand you or don't uh, see what you're actually going through, you feel like you're treated like a leper. You feel like you're treated like an outsider. You don't feel like you're actually connected with other people. Well, that's what this man experienced and felt. But he came and met Jesus. And look at what it says here. Jesus was moved with compassion. He saw this man and he saw his need. And it says here, Jesus reached out and touched him. See, that Jesus could have just said a word and could have healed that person. But because that man had not felt the touch of another human being for who knows how long, maybe months, maybe years, had not felt the touch of another human being, he had such a lonely path. God has created us in a way where where we need physical touch. It's one of the love languages. But this man had not felt that. So Jesus reached out his hand and touched him and he said, I am willing, be healed. And he received that healing. And no longer did he have to be alone or by himself. In the book of Psalms, it says, even though I walk through the valley the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. Why? For you are close beside me. You might feel today like you're, you're, you're a leper. Nobody understands you. Nobody wants to be close to you. People don't understand what you're doing. Jesus understands you. Jesus walks with you. His rod and his staff is there to comfort you. Number three, satisfaction. Satisfaction. Jesus takes the person that's lonely and brings them to a place of satisfaction. There was a woman at, the, at a well that Jesus came and encountered. And he came to her and he said, woman, can you give me something to drink? And she was surprised that Jesus would even ask that. And to make a long story short, Jesus knew that woman could see her past and told her, bring your husband and let's talk. And she said, I don't have a husband And Jesus said, yeah, the five people that you've had before are not your husbands, and the person you have now is not your husband either. And she couldn't believe that Jesus knew all of that. We might be like that woman that's seeking out for relationships. We might be that woman that regardless of whatever relationship we have, we're always seeking out for something else. Nothing satisfies us. Even the most intimate relationship that we can have with another human being wasn't satisfying for her. And maybe in our lives as well, even in the intimacy of marriage, we don't see the satisfaction that we actually want. And sadly, in some marriages, people walk a very lonely path. Maybe, maybe you, you're like that today. That you're surrounded by people, you're surrounded by relationships, but it doesn't bring you satisfaction. 
let me tell you, the person that can satisfy you is Jesus. He's the only one that can fill this God-shaped void that is within us. Look at what Jesus says here. He says um, in John 4, but those who drink the water I give, Jesus says, will never be thirsty again. They'll be satisfied. And it becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. This is what Jesus wants to do for us, to satisfy us with the living water that he gives, with a water that never runs dry, with a water that quenches our thirst. Friends, we could be looking out for this relationship and that relationship, and this thing doesn't satisfy us, so we're going to look for something else. This thing doesn't satisfy us, so we're going to look for something else. And we're always looking, 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 and not being satisfied. Let me tell you, we can look and look and look, but our true satisfaction will be found in Jesus. We are living through an epidemic of loneliness, even though we're surrounded by so many people and surrounded by so many relationships. Jesus is the one that can satisfy us. And we'll continue to look and look and look and never be satisfied until we find our joy and satisfaction in Jesus. He invites us. He says this, come to me, all those who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Are you weary today? Are you carrying a heavy burden today? Jesus died and rose again for you and for me so that we can take our burdens and give it to him. Jesus died for you and for me so that we can come to him and cast all of our cares upon him because he cares for us. This is the beauty of Jesus. This is the truth of the gospel. This is the story of Easter. This is what Jesus has done so that we might experience life in all of its abundance and all of its fullness. We can keep seeking and searching, seeking and searching, but we will find true satisfaction in Jesus. Number four, wholeness. Jesus wants to make us whole. And there's a story of a lame man who Jesus made whole. He also was all by himself. The word of God says in uh, John that one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. He was by this pool, which is called the Pool of Siloam. And every now and then an angel would come and stir the waters and whoever would jump in first would, uh, would receive their healing. But this man who had been sick for 38 years, he was lame. And he, and he told Jesus when Jesus came and he said, I don't have anyone to put me in the water. And whenever I see that happening, somebody else jumps in the water before me and I can never get there in time. This man was having a pity party for 38 years. Have you ever had a pity party? Woe is me. Nobody understands me. Look at my situation. I'm misunderstood by everybody. If they would only know, this man had a pity party. This man was just looking at his own situation. Jesus wanted to make him whole, but he was wallowing in his own situation. Because look at the question that Jesus asks him. He asks him this question, would you like to get well? You know, there are some times that we would rather wallow in our situation than actually find a solution to our situation. There are times when we actually like to, oh, I don't want anyone to help me. I just want to do it myself. And I don't, I don't care about what other people are thinking or saying. And we, we're in our own little world, in our own little situation, in our own situation, without actually getting the help that we need. Jesus is the help that we need. We'd rather walk down a pathway and walk down a lonely, lonely way and just wallow in our own desperation and wallow in our own uh, pity party without actually tapping in to the people that God has provided around us, to the community that God has provided around us, to Jesus who is there to help us. And so Jesus came to this man. For 38 years, he was struggling as a lame man. And Jesus came and healed him. But he asked him, do you want to be healed? Friends, I ask you the same question today. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to change? Do you want a solution to your loneliness? Do you want a solution to your sin? Do you want a solution to your addiction? Do you want a solution to your bondage? Do you want a solution to the difficulty that you're going through? Jesus is able to make that difference for you. But are you willing to come to the foot of the cross and surrender your life to Jesus? And say, yes, Lord, 
I am willing. Yes, Lord, I need you. Because what does Jesus do? Look at what it says in Psalms. He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. Jesus knows what wounds are like. He was beaten and he was whipped before he went to the cross of Calvary. He bled and died for you and for me. He knows what it is to bandage wounds. He knows what it is to bind up the brokenhearted because he was brokenhearted. When all of his disciples left, when his own father had to turn his face away, Jesus knows what it is to be brokenhearted. Jesus knows what it is to walk that lonely path and he wants to heal the brokenhearted. Friends, he is here today and he wants to heal you. He wants to bring health and wholeness to you in your body, in your soul, and in your spirit. He is the holistic healer. And lastly, he wants to bring restoration. There was a woman who had a, had a very lonely path as well. She had a, a, an issue with, with bleeding for many years. And she went to this doctor and that doctor and this doctor and spent all of her, all of the money that she had and she wasn't any the better. Do you, have you been in a situation like that? Use all your money, use all your savings and the situation hasn't changed. I don't know what I'm going to do now. I don't have any more money to spend. And that's the situation of this woman. She had a health problem, a health difficulty. She tried everything that she could, but she had one more hope in her lonely path. When there's no one else to help her, there was no one else to solve the problem. There was no one else that could heal her. There was no one else that could give her any type of hope. She went to Jesus with one minuscule hope, with one tiny fraction of a hope. She said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, the, the edge of his robe, I know if I could just reach out and touch Jesus, I will be healed. That word healed there in the Greek is a beautiful word in the Greek called sozo. It means to be made whole. It means to be healed. It means to be saved. It means to be restored. It means to be brought back to wholeness and fullness. She knew just one touch of Jesus and she could be made whole, she could be restored. Friends, that's the same hope that Jesus gives to us today. He wants us to be made whole. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Are you brokenhearted today? Are you walking down a lonely path today? Are you going down a difficult situation today? Jesus, our Messiah, our Savior, the risen King who we've been singing about is here to rescue us, is here to heal us, is here to make us whole. This is what the whole, the whole resurrection is about. If Jesus can go from death to life, he wants to take us from death to life. If Jesus can go from being dead in the tomb for three days to be the risen Savior and King over all the world, he wants to do the same for us, that we were once dead in our trespasses and sins. We were once dead and alienated from the life of God, and then Jesus came, and if we reach out and touch him, if we have the faith of that woman to say, if I can touch but the hem of his garment, if I can just touch Jesus, I know that if I can come to Jesus, I will be fully made whole. That is the story of Jesus, the message of the gospel and the hope of Easter. That if we can just touch Jesus, we will be made whole. He heals the brokenhearted and heals all those who are crushed in spirit. It's the hope of the resurrection. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Friends, that's the hope. Because Jesus died and rose again, he wants to give us new life. 
And that new life is in a covenanted family. That new life is not a lonely life. That new life is solving the problem of loneliness, solving the problem of oppression, solving the problem of, uh, uh, of all of the different things that keep us in bondage and keep us captives because Jesus came to set us free. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. It's newness of life that he gives to us because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus did the hardest and most impossible thing. And that's to stay dead for three days and then rise again. To deliver us and save us and make us whole is so much easier. He did the hardest thing already. And he showed his power over sin, over death, over hell, and said, I have the victory. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, In his great mercy... He has given us new birth into a living hope. It's a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have such an amazing hope because Jesus rose from the dead. Hope has a name. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. He wants to be with you. He wants to know you. He wants to fellowship with you. Just as Pastor Ken invited Rosario to his house for a meal. And that was the beginning of a journey for her. I want to invite you to dinner. I want to invite you to dinner on April 11th at 7 p.m. And if you want to come, just text the word ALPHA to that number that you see on the screen, 647-931-0015. Just text the word alpha to that number and you can register for dinner on April 11th. It's a time when we can just examine the questions about Christianity and about faith and about what it means to follow Jesus. If you're here and you're just wondering what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus, I don't really understand all of these things of, of what you're talking about, Daniel. I, I don't really understand what it means to, to, to be set free from, by Jesus. I don't understand what it means to commit my life to follow Jesus, well, can you join me for dinner on April 11th? And let's talk about that. Let's explore that. We have a course called the Alpha Course, which we're going to be running in the fall, and this is sort of step one towards that. And maybe, or maybe you're here, and you're feeling like, I, I've been praying, and I don't know if Jesus is really hearing me. Maybe you're here and and you're wondering, I'm going through such a lonely path and a lonely, difficult path. How do I hear God speaking to me? How do I have that communion and fellowship with God? Well, starting on Tuesday, we're running a course called the Lectio Course. And this Lectio Course is is something that's going to help us to pray the scriptures and hear the voice of the Lord. And if you want to do that, you can text the word prayer to that same number, 647-931-0015 to sign up. And if you want to just, if you're a follower of Jesus and you just want to take some more steps towards Jesus and learn what it is to walk with him and know him and fellowship with him so that you don't have to live a lonely pathway or don't have to walk a lonely pathway, then let's learn to to pray the scriptures. Let's learn to hear the voice of God. Let's learn to fellowship together with God. And if you're here for the first time or you're here for one of the first times, You're newish maybe to our community. In the seat back in front of you, you'll see a welcome card. I'd love for you just to fill out that welcome card so that we can connect with you. And then as you go out these doors, there's a welcome desk and we have a a present for you. We have a gift for you on Easter Sunday. So if you fill that welcome card out and go to our welcome desk, we want to bless you with a gift. We want to be able to connect with you and help you along this journey. Friends, Hope has a name. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. I'm going to pray two prayers right now, and I'm going to invite you if you want to pray with me. The first prayer that I'm going to pray is a prayer that if you want to just surrender your life to Jesus and decide to follow him, then pray with me. Lord Jesus, I come to the foot of the cross, and I realize, Lord, that I've been walking a lonely path without you. And so I come to you in acknowledgement that I am a sinner and my sin has separated me from you. 
And so I ask that you would forgive me and that you would cleanse me. And as you rose again to new life, I pray that I would experience today that new life in Jesus. And I'm going to pray another prayer. If you're a follower of Jesus and if you've given your life over to Christ but you still feel distant from the Lord, you, you feel like I'm going through these trials and these difficulties and I need to experience God's presence. I need to know his voice. I need to know that he is the one that bandages my wounds and heals my broken heart. I need to know that he's with me in the valley of the shadow of death. Then pray with me. Lord Jesus, I know that you have called us not to walk this journey alone, but to walk together with you, to be with you. Lord, I pray that, that we would experience and know the intimacy of your presence, the power of your promises, the touch of your healing hand, and the hope of your presence each and every day with us as Emmanuel. Come to us now. Fill us with your spirit. Change us and transform us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
As we sing our final song, we want to see those palms of praise one more time as we worship him. Let's go. Our Redeemer lives. of applause for our choir and our choir director, Pastor Keisha. I, I know you're all going to be tempted to go to Pastor Keisha and be like, can I join the choir too? We really thank God for all the hours that they put into practice. And we have such a, a wonderful reason to rejoice today because our Redeemer lives. He's conquered the grave. He's here to heal us. He's here to deliver us. He's here to save us. He's here to make us whole. Don't leave without experiencing that. Our prayer team is going to be here at the front and at the balcony, and you might see uh, some of them just walking around. If they have a prayer lanyard, feel free to ask them for prayer. If you want uh, a prayer in any way, we would love to be able to pray for you. As we end our service, I want to read a benediction from the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will, 
May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him, all glory to him forever and ever. Amen. We have some coffee and snacks for you at the back. Go in the presence of Jesus, in the presence of Emmanuel. God bless you. Thank you.